Good morning. It's good to see everyone out this morning. I think I'm turned on. Maybe. There we are. Uh, we've got several that are out of town. Of course, we're still in the middle of our fall break. Um, and one of note, Brother Jesse is in Indiana. Uh, he drove up to Indiana yesterday and we'll be doing a week-long meeting uh, there. So let's pray for, for him and his efforts there. All right, so I have um, mentioned about going through the 17 time periods, again, just as a refresher. So I'm not going to ask that everybody uh, do the hand motions. Uh, we didn't even go over the hand motions for those of you that are new, but we are going to flip through these, and so I would like for everybody to say them out loud as we go through. Ready? All right, before the flood, the flood. So the clicker has not been very responsive this morning. All right. Uh, so at some point throughout <clears throat> the quarter, I may have a, something that, well, I'll just have a quiz on the 17 time period. So make sure that you are uh, looking at those uh, throughout the week. Again, I think this is a <clears throat> an excellent way, uh, and it's something that we've been doing now for, for several years, and I know that it's been a benefit to me. Uh, the kids, I think that they're doing really, really well with it, uh, and I think that it can just help us in understanding where things are at uh, within the scriptures. So, of course, the two time periods that we're talking about this quarter are the invasion and, <clears throat> and conquest, which takes place from Joshua chapter 6 through Joshua chapter 24. <clears throat> and I mentioned how we're kind of go, we're going through this rather quickly. So we talked <clears throat> last week, we started with the central campaign, which is Joshua chapters 4 through 8, um, and actually this morning in Lesson 2, we're talking about the Southern Campaign, the Northern Campaign, the list of kings conquered, so all of that happens through Joshua's chapters 9 through 12, and then next lesson we'll talk about the land divided in Joshua 13 through 19, uh, the cities that are given to the priests and the Levites, Joshua chapters 21 and 22, the Transjordanic tribes return home in chapter 22, uh, Joshua challenges Israel in chapter 23, and then the covenant that's renewed at Shechem in Joshua chapter 24. And then pretty quickly we'll move over into the Judges. And again, the time period of the Judges is going to be the book of Judges, the book of Ruth, and then 1 Samuel chapter 1 uh, going through chapter 9. And it lasts up until Saul, of course, is appointed king, which at that point would begin the United Kingdom. So um, we'll look at the, the different Judges. Um, and then end it with uh, talking about Eli and Samuel. All right, so uh, lesson number one, we finished off uh, question seven, and at the very end of class, I had mentioned question eight uh, that I wanted you to kind of think about it a little bit differently. So this is one of those things where when I'm uh, making these questions, I create the questions and I have a certain thing in mind and I should probably do a better job of writing down notes of what I'm thinking when I write the question. I don't do that so then when I go back to answer my own questions, uh, sometimes I learn things new and sometimes I'm like, I don't even know what I was asking. So I apologize uh, to you because if I'm thinking that, you may be thinking that too. But uh, question eight is one that after looking at it more in depth when I was actually answering my own questions, there were some different things that came to light. And I'm going to pick on Lena, not for the sake of picking on Lena, but last week in class she had mentioned about um, the family or the children being destroyed with Achan. And so go ahead and be turned over to Ezekiel chapter 18. We're going to look at um, just a few, we're not going to look at the whole chapter, but a few verses there in Ezekiel chapter 18. And I, I will just, in all honesty, when I created the question or wrote the question, um, my mindset was, okay, the kids, or the, I say kids, the children, the family was destroyed along with Achan. So that was kind of my thought process when writing the question. 
And then when I was answering the question, I had some different thoughts. So Ezekiel chapter 18, let's read uh, verses 19 through 23. We'll start over here with uh, Gil and work our way back. Just take a verse apiece. Ezekiel 18, 19 through 23. Yet you say, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the son has done what is lawful and right and has kept all my statutes and done them. He shall surely live. The soul who sin shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. For the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if the wicked person turns away from all his <coughs> sins that he has committed and keeps my statutes in this way it was just and right, he shall surely live and shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. For the righteousness he has done, he shall live. Not only pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live. All right, this principle is something that is carried over in the New Testament, Romans chapter 2, uh, verses 5 and 6. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Verse 6 says, Who will render to each person according to his deeds. Also over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. All right, and Lena, you may not know the answer to this question, but uh, why would you say last week that the kids or the family was destroyed with Haken? What would give you that impression? Joshua, and all Israel with him, took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the witch of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Acre. And then, obviously, 25, skip a little bit. So Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And also, before that, when God tells Joshua what to do <clears throat> in verse 15, he says, He and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done the disgraceful, disgraceful things. Oh, I'm sorry, let's get, she'll be burnt with fire. Okay. <clears throat> so just, uh, and this is just to everybody, uh, and again, uh, Linda had just brought it up, so I'm not necessarily picking on Linda, just for the sake of picking on her, but she had brought it up last week. Um, so other thoughts on were Aiken's family, was Aiken's family part of this destruction? Gil? Look at to some of the actual Hebrew words here. From what I read, it says he was stoned. And they were there, obviously, the sons and daughters and family were there, but it all his possessions were stoned and then burned fire, but not the families. Okay. So Gil's saying the, the family was there, but they weren't necessarily stoned uh, with everything that he had. Norm, you had your hand up. Um, no, I, I read it the same way Linda did. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a difference between dying in your sins and dying because of your sins. Uh, and I think that's the point that Ezekiel is making, and it's just a simple reading as far as the, what the historical facts are. Um, and so I, I don't have any trouble. I, sometimes we can try to squeeze something out of the scriptures that aren't there just because we don't quite understand the, the relationship between two different principles. But and I think that's the situation we're in right here. So what are we trying to squeeze? I, I think we're trying to go, uh, Ezekiel 18 is talking about uh, people dying in their sins, and so they died physically, and that's wrong because they didn't do anything wrong, and so that's a, that's a, uh, that's a, you know, a contradiction in God's thinking, but there's a big difference between dying in your sins the spiritual death that occurs and the consequences of sin, and uh, and so Ezekiel's talking about the sins and uh, that spiritual complication there, and the consequence can can be death, 
as we see a number of times uh, throughout the scriptures of God, <coughs> is still consistent through all of that. When we talked last week, uh, one of the questions about obviously the consequence of sins can be catastrophic for others, not just necessarily the, the person that is sinning. Um, but I think the principle is still there in the Old Testament and also the New Testament that um, you're going to be punished uh, for your sins. Other thoughts? Ken? I'm just reading the text again. Verse 24 of chapter 7 says that Joshua and all Israel took him, took Achan the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge, the gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, and so on. 25 says, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Thank you. So... First it says him, and then it says them. <laughs> so it sounds like everybody. Okay. Uh, yeah, and interesting that in the context, we talked last week about the one who would rebuild Jericho, and he's the one who's sinning by rebuilding Jericho, but he loses his firstborn son when he lays his foundation, and he loses his youngest son when he sets up his gates. So uh, the, the Lord allowed it. Ms. Sheriff? Well, 25 said that the congregation stoned him. They didn't say anything about stoning him. So. All right, so this is one of the reasons why I wanted to, to, for everybody to kind of think about it a little bit deeper because at, at initial reading, I had the same thought as Lena uh, and as Norm. I mean, I read it, and that's the reason I even come up with uh, the question was, okay, the whole family was was burned or stoned or... Uh, whatever, but, but at looking at it deeper, there is some difference depending upon which translation you are reading. I read out of the New American Standard, um, and so the translation for, for me in verse 25 is them. It's not him. Most translations actually say that it stoned him, and if you go back and look at all the ancient manuscripts, it's, it's him. It's not them um, that was stoned. And then Gil brought up in verse 24 that it talks about his uh, his sons and daughters, so they were brought up there with them. Doesn't necessarily mean, at least I don't think that it's clear that they were then, because they were brought up in, in verse 24, they were stoned or they were burned. Uh, they could have been there witnessing what was going on. Um, and so I don't, I don't think that it's clear as to were they or were they not. Uh, and I just wanted to, so this is a, an article uh, that I had read, I just wanted to go through. So uh, there's two responses to the problem. The problem of, okay, well, if, if the kids or if the family, I keep saying kids, uh, and they, they were his kids, but that doesn't mean that they were small. So some have argued that Aiken's children were not given capital punishment with him, but merely brought along so that the event could be an example to them. In favor of this, several things are offered. First, it is noted that nowhere does the text say anyone besides Aiken committed the crime. God speaks of the guilty as he who is taken with the accursed thing in verse 15. Also, Achan confesses alone, I have sinned in verse 20, and I have coveted, verse 21. Second, the text declares that Israel stoned him, verse 25. The reference to burning them, in verse 25, alludes to the silver, gold, and garment he had taken, verse 21 and 24. Third, stoning Achan's family for his crime would be a clear violation of the Old Testament law, which says emphatically that the son shall not bear the guilt of the father. Um, and then another view acknowledged that Achan's family was stoned with him, but argues that they are complicit with his crime, so they were being punished for their own sins, not his. This possession notes, or position notes the following. First, it is argued that it is unlikely that Achan could have accomplished this deed and hidden the stolen material in the family tent without their knowing something about it. Second, the guilt of the family is implied in their very, uh, in their very punishment. Since it was forbidden to punish someone for another sin, the family must have sinned with him or else they would not have been punished with him. Third, God had the right to take life since it is he who gave it, Deuteronomy 32, 39. Job rightly declared the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Fourth, there is no reference to small children in the family, but even if there were, God has the sovereign right to take them and sometimes does in sickness without implying their guilt. Further, if the parents were killed, then there would be no parents to care for them. It would be more merciful for God to take them into his direct care. This is because children who die before the age of accountability you're saved there's no problem about their eternal destiny um, and I'm not saying that I agree with everything that is written here uh, I will say I don't think that the kids were small Aiken obviously is going to be older in age at this point point. and so the ultimate point for me is 
Um, I, I don't think that it's clear as to whether or not the kids or the family uh, was part of this uh, or not. Does it matter? I don't think that it necessarily matters. It's just something that, um, again, I'm telling myself I have to be careful when I read and make assumptions, and this is just with all of God's Word. Um, whenever we're, we're reading and making sure that we are paying attention to normal. I think the essential point to uh, recall, because, I mean, there are, there are many, many, many circumstances and instances and examples in the Bible of God taking uh, innocent life from uh, the standpoint as a result of consequences. And uh, like you can go back to Egypt and the taking of the firstborn. Uh, certainly those firstborns, you know, were not, if they were babies out of the, just out of the womb and they were the firstborn, they would have died that night if there was no blood over the doors, for instance. All, all of those things. So we don't have to get twisted around with the, with this, the idea of physical consequences as a result of somebody's sin out there. The, it, the sin out there is the bad thing that God is dealing with. The physical consequences are what happens as a result of sin. And those things, those things happen. The, uh, the, the person that has all of their kids in the car with them, young to old, and, and they're driving while drunk or whatever. Uh, I mean, if they happen to get, you know, as a result, kill their, their kids, you know, it's, it's not God killing them. It's the circumstances of the sin that ended up with that. But so, uh, I think we have to be careful because uh, this isn't a situation where uh, Aiden took his family with him into battle and they ended up dying because, I mean, God was directly a part of this. Well, think uh, so it, it's different. I think this, the situation is different because of the consequences that our children and our family may face and, and this. Um, I, but I, that, I, that was one reason that I asked the okay. question. Because God, God is directly involved in what's happening here. Well, that's what uh, I'm saying. Sam, like, for instance, Korah is, uh, is another example. We have many, many where there's huge numbers of people that are, are destroyed who had absolutely nothing to do with the initial sin but they're involved in the consequences. And God's not sinning by doing that. Sam? So uh, the previous slide, the, the last paragraph, where it says, you know, you wouldn't go and stone, like, the gold and, and like, the donkeys or whatever, whatever Achan like, had, but is there a Levitical law that, that commands Israel to burn people after they were stoned? So, like, why, why would they go and burn... I guess Achan and his family after stoning them that wasn't commanded to them. Like, is that is that uh, burning just for the items, or is it for I guess them, like, like the family as well? Because I guess that would lead me to believe. Because I read a translation that said that they stoned him, being Achan, but then they burned them. Right, which is what most of the translations will. Uh, chapter seven, verse fifteen. This is where. Uh, God tells Joshua what to do and God tells him then it shall be that he who is taken with the cursed thing shall be burnt with fire he and all that he has so in this case God specifically tells them to burn him okay and I think it's, a, it's more about you're trying to there's got to be purity in camp again and so you've got to remove the sin from the camp all right, my apologies for getting bogged down in that because We've got a lot we got to get to. So, uh, question number nine: How can we apply the principle of obedience as seen in our text to modern day situations where God's instructions might not align with our own understanding or expectations? You know what you think? I don't know. You want to pay? Uh, there is no. Nothing in life to which we can say we have absolute certainty on X, Y, or Z throughout all of its entirety. In the military, if you're in a job, there's something will occur that you are not sure of. Uh, and in that instance, you fall back on what you rely on in those situations, in the military to train. With God, it's faith. It's faith that whatever his instruction is, if you don't understand it or whatever, you simply do it and trust that he is correct, and on the other side, his promises are still true. 
And it's, we do the same thing in everything that we do, whether we're at work or we see something happen, we're like, well, if I put these two things together, that's going to hold for a little while until we can get something fixed. If it's a military, like, well, this has never happened, I'm going to take cover behind this thing over here. Why? Because that's what you've been trained to do. And you just have faith that if you do what you've trained to do, you do what you know that should be done, then it will still work out. And God is the same way. The obedience is still there. He's given the instruction. You just follow it. And maybe you never get understanding on why. But that doesn't matter. The obedience and the faith is, I'm still going to do what God says, because he said, if I do, I will be rewarded in the end. And so I'm just going to do what he says, whether I understand it or not. You know, it's like, I don't want to oversimplify it, but it is pretty simple. And you just have to do it. Um, there's absolutely no reason, there's no logical reason for the children of Israel to go marching around the city of Jericho. I mean, it makes no sense. But yet in Hebrews 11, verse 30, it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. And if you go back, and we won't take the time to read it, but back in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, um, uh, Paul is talking about how that God is, is, is using things that are not necessarily great uh, to, to kind of help fulfill his purpose. And it's also uh, for us to recognize that we have nothing to boast in, our, in and of ourselves. There's nobody that was walking around that city of Jericho that is going to, to come away from that and say, I had something to do with that. Now, this was God. Now, you had to have the faith and you had to have the belief uh, to do that, but victory came because of the Lord. And so we're going to boast in the Lord. So we have to have faith, we have to have the belief, and we just have to do it. If God said it, we're going to do it. Miss Shirley? Other comments on number nine. Hi, right, number ten. What's the significance of and what can we learn from the conversation between Joshua and the Lord following the sin of Achan and defeat of Ai? So go ahead and turn there to Joshua chapter seven. And let's read uh, 10 through 13. Where did we end up at? Josh, were you the last one that read? All right, so... Mark, if you want to do uh, Joshua chapter 7, verse 10, and then we'll come up here to Todd and Bonnie and do 11 and 12, and then Ken 13. Okay, uh, Joshua 7, 10. The Lord said to Joshua, Get up, why have you fallen on your face? <clears throat> Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And they have even taken some of the things under the ban and, and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the band from your midst. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies uh, until you take away the cursed thing from among you. All right, what do you take away from that? Okay. Things were in the camp. I mean, the accursed things were in the camp, so as long as they were in the camp, they were. So there's one, there's one phrase that's actually mentioned twice. Verse 10 and verse 13. So God's talking to Joshua. Joshua, obviously, at this, at this point, he's, uh, he's struggling. Uh, I think he's probably a little bit discouraged about uh, what's going on and what's God's response to him. Get up, man. <laughs> this shouldn't be a surprise. Like... You should understand there's something going on here. Uh, and so God is like, get up and do something about it. All right, now let's just go take care of the problem. All right, I, I'm going to be with you. I have been with you. Uh, but if there's going to uh, be sin in the camp, I'm not going to be with you. So get up and do something about it. Rise up. Norm? 
Yeah. You get any group of people together, there's going to be problems. Uh, it, it just you can just count on it, and and it's not necessarily because they're doing something bad, but it could be, and uh, and it's not necessarily the whole group. It could be just one part of the group, but any group. And, and so this, this whole thing is, is about us working as a group together. And I don't want to indicate Joshua, because in lesson two, question number 10, we're going to talk a lot about Joshua's leadership qualities. But um, I think God is probably a little bit surprised here. The, the plan was very clear. Uh, and so if, if you're not successful, that should tell you, Joshua, that something is wrong. So get up, do something about it. 6 verse 18, like it said, and he used our all means of saying from that curse. Like he had already had that warning. This wasn't you know, a surprise, I guess. Like right. He had that instruction. Yeah. Other comments on number 10? Norpe? Uh, well, so it should be at AI instead of of AI. Uh, but the interesting part is that as soon as this is done, Joshua like immediately goes into complain mode. <laughs> Just now, you want to go. When you're starting out with this, he's starting with God. What's up with this? You're doing wrong. We're going to be in trouble. And it was all based on his human understanding. And I think a lot of times we fall into the same trap. Something goes wrong. And we immediately look elsewhere to find something to complain about as to why it went wrong. And in this case, God's got to smack him upside the head of it and say, hey, get up. There is something wrong. Your first question should have been, what can I do to fix what I'm in? Have I done anything wrong in your sight? And even if you think you've done right in your sight, that's the introspection that should have been taken first. God, that's not supposed to happen. What have we done wrong? Yeah, but he went immediately to the complaint. He went to the people of who have done it. He was certain he hadn't done it. It was like, all right, somebody. But it, again, our human nature is we want to complain first. And that's a really hard habit to kick because we are so good at it. All right, last question for lesson number one. What's the significance of God allowing the Israelites to take the plunder and livestock from AI contracting to the complete destruction of, of Jericho? So obviously we're talking about the sin of Achan. Everything was supposed to have been destroyed uh, with Jericho, uh, but not with AI. So... What do you take away from that, Norm? Go back into the uh, promises. Uh, the, uh, the the Jericho thing was like a firstborn. It, 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 you had there's certain offerings that come from the the firstborn part of it. But after that, they were supposed to take these cities God's giving them as gifts, and they can't just go through and just wipe every city out and just knock them all down. They had no place to live. So this is the start of that process of go in, kill the people, but take the things that they have, and that's a gift from God. Okay. So Norm danced all around the word that I would like to, to take away from the first fruits. First fruits. Okay, so uh, as we've studied from, um, from the, the old law and the things that God was expecting of the people, it is the first of everything is the Lord's. All right. What what was the reason for that? The original um, bringing them out, taking the firstborn, and uh, and and then uh, redeeming them, and then having a substitute for those that were redeemed. And so everything is the Lord's. The first of everything is going to be the Lord's uh, when they would harvest yeah, their their firstborn um, of of even the the cattle. And so this is the the first fruits of the promised land. And God is providing all of this to them and, and it is going to be uh, the, the first fruits. And so it belongs to the Lord. And yes, from, from af, uh, or this point on, everything is going to be able to be plundered by the people. They're going to, uh, some of the cities that they're going to obviously keep, uh, they're plundering. But one of the things that is very interesting to me is just think about it from Achan's perspective. You know, sometimes we, we just want what we want. We want it now. If Achan would have just waited, Achan would have gotten whatever he wanted from Ai. But he can't wait. He's got to have it now. But the Lord has said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. Uh, 
and we know that he did, but because of Achan and his uh, covetousness, uh, he was not able to, to wait on the Lord's commands, and it was just right there. All right, let's uh, move on to questions for lesson two. All right, so question number one. Considering Exodus 34, 11, and 12, Deuteronomy 7, and Deuteronomy 20, verses 15 through 18, what was the issue with making a covenant with the Gibeonites? Norm? Uh, they were one of the Canaanite cities that uh, were supposed to be destroyed. And so had Joshua known, certainly would not have violated it because uh, that was... It was pretty clear what they were supposed to do with these guys, but he got fooled, and that's the other questions. <laughs> okay, so from the passages there, it's very clear that they're not to, to have a covenant, uh, make a treaty with these people. And one of the things that I think we need to, to pay attention to, because one of the, the, uh, the groups that's listed in Deuteronomy, uh, also Exodus, is specifically uh, the Hivites, and over in... Um, Joshua chapter 8, verse 7. I'm sorry, 9, verse 7. Uh, the writer here uh, states specifically, but the men of Israel said to the Hivites. And so uh, they didn't call them Gibeonites. They're specifically called Hivites here, and which we know from Exodus and also Deuteronomy that they were not to make a treaty. Uh, with the, the Hivites. <clears throat> and the, the other interesting thing is, so the Gibeonites show up and they look like they've been on this long journey. And did the people just go along with it? Okay. They're suspicious. It's like, okay, this, this, doesn't, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't look right. Uh, but yet they went ahead and went along with it. And one of the commentaries that I read um, in regards to this, it says, It is strange that they should have had such a suspicion as the Gibeonites had acted so artf artfully, and it is strange that having such a suspicion, they acted with so little caution. And so they are suspicious about what's happening, but yet they continue uh, to, to go along with it. So let's read uh, Joshua 9, and let's read uh, 16 through 23 as we look at question 2. Is there any other, any other comments on question number 1? All right, so uh, Joshua 9, beginning in verse 16. So, Miss Sue, we'll uh, start with you and then work our way back. And after we get to Norm, we'll jump back to Miss Shirley. So, 16 through 23. Okay. And it happened at the end of three days after they had made a covenant with them that they heard that they were their neighbors who dwelt near them. Then the children of Israel journeyed and came to their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Jephira, uh, Berioth, and Kirjan, Jerim. But the children of Israel did not attack them, because the rulers of the congregation were, had sworn to the Lord God of Israel, and all the congregation complained against the rulers. But all the leaders said to the whole congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we cannot touch them. This we will do to them. We will let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we swore to them. The leaders said to them, Let them live. So they became hewers of wood and drawers of water for the whole congregation, just as the leaders had spoken to them. Joshua summoned them, and he said to them, Why did you deceive us, saying, We were very far from you when you dwell among us? Now therefore you are cursed, and none of you shall be free from being slaves, woodcutters, and water carriers from the house of my God. All right, so question number two. <clears throat> Why did the Israelites go ahead and just not go ahead and destroy the Gibeonites. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> obviously they've come to the realization now they've been uh, bamboozled and uh, 
they might have been thinking in their mind, all right, so we made this under false pretense, so let's just go ahead and deal with them the way that we should have dealt with them in the beginning. Why did they not do that, Miss Shirley? Naked vows and what the what's involved with the vow and consequences of it and all of that and so they're in a situation where they will be sinning against God if they break this law. All right. Other comment. So uh, it's interesting that the people recognize this is a problem and they're upset with the leaders. Why in the world would you do this? Uh, and. I think the leaders at this point are having to acknowledge, yeah, we made a mistake. But that doesn't mean that we can now make another mistake. All right? When we do something wrong, we can't then do something wrong to try to make the first wrong right. What do we say? Two wrongs don't make a right. All right? Yeah, we made a mistake. We messed up. Um, but we can't now make matters worse by breaking God's law, by violating the oath that they had made uh, with them can't do something wrong just because we did something wrong. Number three, consider 2 Samuel 21, 1 through 6. How important was it to God that Israel keep the vow they made to the men of Gibeon even 400 plus years later? And for the sake of time, we won't go and read that. But Ecclesiastes 5, verse 5. It's better to, not to vow than to vow and not keep it. Okay. All right. The law is the law. We'll talk about that one in the, the next question. So, what was the situation there in, in Second Samuel? So, a soul decided to do the job and kill the mouth, and for that, David had to. Uh, well, reconcile it and talk to uh, the people of Gibeon, I guess, what did they want for what happened. And he had to give seven descendants of Saul to be hanged as a reconciliation. So when did that event happen? Saul and the plan of the Gibeonites. Oh, uh, United Kingdom. <laughs> uh, okay, during the time period of the United Kingdom, uh, we actually don't have a record of, of this actually taking uh, place, so sorry, that was a trick question. Good answer, Norm. Um, there are some that say that this happened uh, when Saul was at Nob in the first lane of 22 and verse 19, and we have no way of knowing that for sure, but obviously it did happen where Saul uh, was slain the Gibeonites. And you know, all of these years later, there was a problem because there had been a vow that had been made. There had been this uh, agreement that had been made. And so God does not excuse the obligation of the promise just because of the passage of time. And I think that is something for us to think about and consider uh, as we uh, talk about question four is we've got to keep our promises. It doesn't matter how long uh, time uh, has passed. Uh, we've got to make sure that we keep them. Norm P., can you ring the bell for us? Daddy? There's a good example over there in Judges chapter 11 where Jephthah had to kill his uh, daughter because of the terrible vow that he had made. So that really <clears throat> shows us how uh, powerful or how strong God's word is concerning the uh, vows. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, in some of these questions, I should probably just put them together, but then I also don't want to have one question with five questions, but question four does go along really, really well with question three, so uh, let's go ahead and get into that. So what additional applications might we draw from James 5, 12 when we consider in the, uh, it, in the context of Joshua 9 and Israel's vow to the giving nine times of God wants to refrain from making vows. So James 5, 12 says, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any uh, other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Norm? Uh, the, the reason that God uh, is so against us making, making vows is because it takes a whole bunch, it, 
it, it, it, it puts a, a, this kind of fence around you on uh, circumstances that can occur and the chances of you going into a double jeopardy situation now where, you, where because of this stupid vow that I made over here, now these circumstances make it so that I have this second law of God that now I'm in a situation where I, if I have to do this other one, to, but if I can do that, I'm sinning on and breaking this one. If I break do this one, then I'm breaking this one. In fact, that's what vows do. They 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 uh, fence you in and take a whole bunch of options off the table. No. Uh, we have always considered our words to be the lesser of two evils, and it's the exact opposite. God has always considered our words, just like His own, to be extremely powerful and most important. And it's shown in how he treats those who lie, those who deceive, those who make vows and don't keep them. Our words mean more than just swinging in a blade and killing somebody. It seems from what God looks at because our, our words can destroy the soul. Somebody can recover from a wound. But we all look like, oh, murder, that's really super bad. God's going to throw liars into the lake of fire. And all they did was say something out of their mouth that was wrong. And we keep trying to conflate the two as this one's really bad over the other. But God sees them the same. And they are extraordinarily important, especially when you look at all the teaching God has on what you're supposed to say, how you're supposed to say it. And if you don't have the power that God has to keep his vow, then don't make it. So what does it say about our word uh, if we're having to make oaths? It's not worth much. It's not worth much. Uh, it's probably because we're not faithful to our word. I mean, we can go look over Matthew chapter 5, 34 through 37, but our truthfulness, should, it should be so dependent uh, or dependable and consistent that there's no need to, to make an oath. Um, and Milton wrote in regard to James 5 here, says, Our mere word should be as utterly trustworthy as the signed document, legally correct and complete. So our yes should be yes and our no should be no. That's our word. Sam? I mean, if our yes is supposed to be yes, and likewise with our no's, then as far as like the matter of us being a liar or not, that doesn't really change whether we make the vow or we just say that we're going to do it. But uh, when I read I guess, chapter 4 before, like, the most significant part of, of that chapter is when uh, we're told to, to not assume, you know, how long we will live or what we will do in the future, you know, it's if the Lord wills. It almost seems like if you make a vow saying, I will do this, or I will do this, you assume that nothing will uh, manipulate that situation as well. And I think there's like an aspect of pride in that as well. Like when you see all the vows being made in the Old Testament, like the, the covenants that God makes with Israel, it's between you know the creator of the universe and the people who he's already made promises to. So I think you might be safe in that situation. I, I, that, that's clearly the case. But for you to just go out and say, well, I vow I'm going to do this for you, you're kind of assuming a lot of stuff there. I think you're putting yourself in a position that you're really not in. And I think that's the problem with it as well. You can brought up in the last uh, question, Ecclesiastes 5. If you go look at Ecclesiastes 5, verses 1 through 7, uh, I think that, that that whole passage there uh, kind of talks a lot about making vows too hasty, uh, which the example that Daddy brought up is a, a good one, and so we have to be careful for that. If we do make a vow uh, from Ecclesiastes 5, verse 4, you can't delay to pay it. you got to make sure that you pay it. Um, and verse 5, it's better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Again, so you better make sure you pay it. And you don't need to make excuses. There are no excuses for not keeping your, your vows, again, regardless of the passage of time. Norm, real quick. Uh, and God, the reason God can make promises and, and they don't change is God can see the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. There is no, I mean, He can see it all. We are short sighted at best and uh, manipulative at worst. And, uh, and so our promises uh, to, to even think that we can, we can uh, like uh, Sam was saying, see the circumstances of the future that are going to make it possible for us to. To keep going down the same direction, forget it. We're not. <laughs> we're not going to do that. Thanks, everybody. We'll pick up with question five next week.